Welcome back to another episode of What's Up, Prof? Hello, Walter. This time you beat me to it, right? I have to try sometimes to be ahead. Okay. It yeah. doesn't work always. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open with a word of prayer, and we can start. Our Heavenly Father, thank you once again for bringing us together. Thank you for having us do these discussions, and we and ask that you enlighten our minds, that we can do it the way that you would like us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, Martin, as we said, we do not only want to say where we are standing in the current world events, but we also would like to discuss some of the spiritual aspects that need to fall into place. So, while the world is preparing to uh, introduce the next wave, mm. let's put it that way, uh, we can talk about spiritual things and then when the next wave comes we can report on the Pope's letter and That's on uh, COP27 COP and all of these things that are taking place. But while they're giving us a breather, let's talk about spiritual things as well. Because actually, isn't that what we have to prepare to take on all of these things? Yes, because we... We are not supposed to only know what's happening in the world, but we need to prepare spiritually for what is coming upon the world. Because if we are not spiritually prepared, we will not be able to stand. No. We need to have the faith of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the faith of Jesus was prepared to go to the cross. So we and Peter, at that stage... Never had the faith of Jesus. No. He had the faith of Peter. Yeah. And three times he denied. And I was just reading again last night, and I found it, again, so overwhelming. The first one who asked him, are you not one of them, was the, the lady who kept the door. So when he came in, yeah. <laughs> at the door the very already. First one he saw, said, you're one of them. He said, no, I'm not. Then he went and warmed, warmed himself at the fire, right? And he warmed himself. And they, all of them, said, you're one of them. And he denied it, right? Now the third one who asked him, do you remember where it was? It was inside where Jesus was accused, but I can't remember. Exactly. And, and when I read it, it suddenly struck me. Why do I miss these things? Uh -huh. I missed it. I, I really missed it. The, the third one who asked him was the one whose ear had been cut off. Oh, wow, okay, no. Yes, I didn't know. it's in the Gospel of John. The one whose ear has been cut off. I, I recognize <laughs> you. <laughs> wow. And that's why he must have been so adamant because... He knew it was he was the the high priest servant or whatever, and he knew that he'd cut off his ear, so he had to deny it most vehemently. Isn't that interesting? It is, but God put those three people there. Yes, those three groups. Yeah. First a, a lady, then a group, and then the very one who had been confronted by Peter. That's the one, and uh, that was too much for him. So Martin, we need to be prepared yeah, for what is yeah, coming. Yeah. So this one is titled, Arise and Shine. Well, we're heading for the crisis of the ages. So that's what we need to prepare for, right? At least in a spiritual sense. In Joel chapter 2, we read, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. So this is our job, right? Mm. This is what God's people have to do. Troublous times are right upon us. The fulfilling of the signs of the times gives evidence that the day of the Lord is near at hand. I just went through the news and I saw all of these events taking place where Christian nationalism mm. is on the rise. And I'm sure you're gathering a lot of information. So uh, the listeners must be aware that we are looking at all yeah. of these things. But let's wait until we have a nice package to put together. Oh, well. 
And then we can see where we're going. We, uh, three, I think three episodes ago, we in actual fact did one on the Christian nationalists. Yes, but the, the, the momentum oh, is picking up. Eh? Really sp picking and up. And you have articles in The Guardian and you have articles in, in prominent places where they are talking about it. Just on, okay, now that we're on that point, but it's um, not strange, it's actually scary how the Christian nationalism is also linking to civil war. Yes, all of that is coming together and how the immorality is being legislated more and more. But we're not going there. It's, we just read here, the fulfilling of the signs of the times gives evidence that the day of the Lord is near at hand. Just to show that, you know, this is really happening. The daily papers are full of indications of a terrible conflict in the future. Bold robberies of frequent occurrence. Strikes are common. We just had a strike in our country that laid the transport industry lame. The shipping industry was lame. Nothing can be exported. Nothing can be imported. The farmers' goods are rotting on, in the ship's holds. And uh, it's just a calamity. Thefts and murders are committed on every hand. Men possessed of demons are taking the lives of men and women and little children. All these things testify that the coming of Christ is near at hand. In accidents and calamities, by land and by sea, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes, terrific hailstorms, tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, earthquakes in every place and in thousands of forms, Satan is exercising his power. The crisis is stealing gradually upon us. The sun shines in the heavens, passing over its usual round, and the heavens still declare the glory of God. Men are still eating and drinking, planting and building, marrying and giving into marriage. Merchants are still buying and selling. Pleasure lovers are still crowding to theaters, horse races, gambling hells. The highest excitement prevails, yet probation's hour is fast closing. And every case is about to be eternally decided. Satan sees that the time is short. He has set all the agents to work that men may be deceived, deluded, occupied, entranced until the day of probation shall be ended and the door of mercy be forever shut. So Martin, do we have a work to do? And the time is short. All right, so let's continue. The time is right upon us. When there will be sorrow that no human balm can heal, sentinel angels are now restraining the four winds, that they shall not blow till the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. But when God shall bid the angels loose the winds, there will be a scene of strife such as no pen can picture. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together under me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So Martin, this is the state of the world. And this is the time that we are living in. And how much more so now than when these words were penned, right? So much more. So we must be partakers of Christ's suffering here if we should share in his glory hereafter. If we seek our own interest, how we can best please ourselves instead of seeking to please God and advance his precious suffering cause, we shall dishonor God and the holy cause we profess to love. We have but a little space of time left in which to work for God. Nothing should be too dear to sacrifice for the salvation of the scattered and torn flock of Jesus. Those who make a covenant with God by sacrifice now will soon be gathered home to share a rich reward and possess the new kingdom forever and ever. Oh, let us live holy for the Lord and show by a well-ordered life and godly conversation that we have been with Jesus and are his meek and lowly followers. We must work while the day lasts, for when the dark night of trouble and anguish comes, it will be too late to work for God. Jesus is in his holy temple, 
and will now accept our sacrifices, our prayers, our confessions of faults and sins, and will pardon all the transgressions of Israel, that they may be blotted out before he leaves the sanctuary. When Jesus leaves the sanctuary, then they who are holy and righteous will be holy and righteous still, for all their sins will then be blotted out, and they will be sealed with the seal of the living God. But those that are unjust and filthy will be unjust and filthy still. For then there will be no priest in the sanctuary to offer their sacrifices, their confessions, their prayers before the Father's throne. Therefore what is done to rescue souls from the coming storm of wrath must be done before Jesus leaves the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Martin, I don't know about you, but I feel driven. It's as though I can see the sand of time running out and there are so many people, even within our own family, that are not ready. Yeah. And the time, as you say, is depleting so quick that something spiritual, godly, is driv driving you. How do you prepare minds that do not want to be prepared? How do you reach people that have closed the door? How do you touch a spiritual cord? How do you do it? Well, we can't, cannot. But it's frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where God comes in. We are the sowers. He's the husbandman. Yeah, he must make it grow. But Martin, it seems as though <laughs> the odds are stacked against us. <laughs> Definitely. It seems that the, the enemy is not only working from without, he's working from within as well. And he's, he's very effective when it comes to working within, right? We have more to fear from within than from without. That is problematic. So Isaiah gives us our marching orders, and this is also where we take our title from. Arise, shine, for thy light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. So Martin, if you have had great light, that means you have great responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just say, well, I've, I've got the light. I'm so glad I have the light. What about those that don't have the light? What is that? Verse that says you can't hide it under a bushel. Now when we were blind we were with excuse. But when he made that little puddle of mud and put it on our eyes and sent us to the pool of Siloam which means sent. Then you are sent to perform a, a certain duty. You have to go and witness to those who don't want to hear. <laughs> right? Yeah. So he went to the Pharisees. <laughs> and they said to him, who healed you? And he said it was Jesus. But he hadn't seen him yet. But he knew it was. And he opened the eyes. And never since the world began has it been that someone opened the eyes of those that were born blind. If this man was a sinner or not, I know not. One thing I do know is I was blind and now I see. This man is a sinner because he did it on the Sabbath day. And you were born in sin, they said to him. Whether he was a sinner or not, I don't know. But I know that I was blind and now I see. Do you want to be his disciples too if you ask me again? Woo. Can you imagine that story? So in other words, when you have received light, then you are sent. And when you are sent, you run up against a brick wall. <laughs> That's it. Eh? That's life. That's life, right? And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. That's quite a promise. Eh? Lift up thine eyes around about and see, all they gather themselves together. They come to thee. Thy son shall come from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. That's the nations. 
the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee, the multitude of camels shall cover thee, and the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All they from Sheba shall come, they shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Oh, what do you make of that promise? When is that going to take place, Martin? The latter rain. Martin, this is the latter rain. Can you imagine, Martin, when they start coming, when the nations start coming? But before they can come, they must have a message. Mm -hmm. In other words, we must give the message. Yeah, the loud cry. And then comes the loud cry. Mm. And the loud cry is a harvesting call. That's a they must have already heard the message. I mean, the, the message went out in the time of Jesus, right? Before the early rain. Yeah. Jesus had sown the good seed. And he had sown the good seed. And the people had watched the miracles. And the people knew about him. The people knew all of these things. But they weren't convicted. Mm -hmm. They'd heard his parables. They'd heard his teachings. They, they discussed it amongst themselves. They argued about it. Some of them condemned it. Some of them accepted it. The whole gambit, the truth was out there. But it lay dormant. And then under the power of the early rain, they came in by the thousands. Is this going to happen at the end? Yes, at the latter rain. Yes. Even, even more. Grow, even more so. Yeah. So in other words, all these people will come. But they must have something to come to. Do you think they are arguing about some of the presentations that are going into the world today, not only from us, but from many, many speakers, and thinking, well, have these people got a point, or have they not got a point? Are they arguing about these issues? Yes. Have you seen this one? Have you heard about that one? Are these people insane? Are they nuts? Are they this? Are they that? You know? Did it happen in the time of Jesus? Definitely. So we have to agitate, 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 mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, we have opposition. Numerous. Did Jesus have opposition? <laughs> yes. They Did actually. the disciples have opposition? Hmm? They were actually all killed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's very, very encouraging, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> but this is going to happen. This is what must happen under the latter rain. Arise and shine, for your light has come. Must you have light in order to give light? Mm -hmm. Cannot do it any way other. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 7, All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nabaiot shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Is he talking about sheep and goats? No. He's talking about people. He's talking about people. Who are these? that fly as a cloud and as the doves to their windows. Surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel because he has glorified thee. Now the silver and gold, Martin, is it literal? No. Isn't silver character that has been refined in yeah. the fire? Mm -hmm. And gold is faith and love? So these people will have accepted the gospel and they must be gathered. So they will come from all over the world and the sons of the strangers shall build up thy walls. In other words, they'll defend the commandments of God. They must have heard about them from someone. And their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor I have had mercy on thee. Therefore thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night. What do the gates stand for, Martin? For judgment. That's where the judges used mm. to gather. They always used to gather at the gate. And the wall was quite a thick wall, and so the judiciary was actually built into the wall at yeah. the gate and you went to the gate for judgment. And judgment is based on the law. So the gates of judgment shall be open continually to receive these people. Uh, who's the one who judges them? 
God. God. Yeah. He brings the men. The Holy One of Israel. That men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles and that their kings may be brought. For the nation and the kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. Now Martin, in other words, what they are saying, what Isaiah is saying here, if they do not acknowledge that you have the truth, they will be lost. That's so it's not that the kings will come and serve you. They will acknowledge that you are representing a higher kingdom mm -hmm. and that they have to obey that kingdom, which is the kingdom of the Lord. So this is the great promise of what will happen under the latter reign. To an extent also under the former reign. Because even people from Caesar's household were converted. Yeah. And many kings thereafter in the Reformation mm -hmm. were converted. And leaders were converted. And in the end, there will be people, even in the political realm, that will acknowledge the truth and come out. Yeah. So we mustn't write off everyone. No. No. We must look at some of them and think, oh, this one has n will never make it. You see, the problem is we've, you've mentioned this many times before. Yes. It's like we, if you had to judge Aaron. Yes. You would have been wrongly judged him because when he did the calf, yes. the golden calf, <laughs> write him off. <laughs> write this? him off. Yes, we mustn't write off anyone. We must just keep on on. Praying, because there were many kings in Israel that did horrendous things that were converted in the end. So God will give the wisdom. The glory of Lebanon shall come upon thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, the box together. Is he talking about trees? No. So if you are righteous, the Bible refers to the, the righteous as trees planted in a fertile valley or along the streams. To beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despised thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. This is a great promise that many, many that were against you will eventually see the light. So you must never lose hope. Always have faith that God can change and save anybody. Oh, Paul mentions the three. Faith, hope, and love, right? And the greatest of these is? Love. Love. Hope will go. Faith will go. Love will remain. Love will remain forever. Yeah. But faith and hope will disappear out of the dictionary. Because once you have attained, you don't have to hope for it. And once you can see it, you yeah. don't have to have faith anymore. Yeah. That's always such a, a difficult one to understand where Jesus actually says. You know, there are some things that you, you wonder, why is it written like this? Or why did the Lord say things the way that he did? We're speaking about faith, right? Mm. We're speaking about love. We're speaking about hope. And... You know, if I take my Bible and if I remember correctly, it's in John, I think it's chapter 14. No, it's in chapter 16. 16, where Jesus says from verse 8, And when he is come, this is the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, right? Those three. And then he, he qualifies it. Of sin, because they believe not on me. So Martin, is it a sin not to believe Christ? Definitely. Or to believe in him? Definitely. That's a sin, right? Yeah. So, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me, he said. So, if you do not believe that, it's a sin. Sin. And that means you can't have eternal life because the wages of sin is death. It's a, and so it's a strange way of saying it, of sin, because they believe not on me. And then the next one is even stranger. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Faith. Faith. 
Because it's righteousness by faith, right? So why must it be by faith? Because he's not here and you can't see him see anymore. Him. Therefore it has to be by faith. Yeah. But faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it has to be righteousness by faith. So how am I saved? Through faith. faith. And I can only exercise faith in something that I cannot see. Right? Yes. <laughs> So it's actually a brilliant way of putting it, of righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Therefore, you have to accept it by faith. And if you don't accept it by faith, you're lost. That's it. So now what about all these systems that don't accept righteousness by faith? They have to. What are those systems that declare it an anathema? How do they get past verse 10? No. They're in big trouble, right? And then of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. But Martin, he's a roaring lion. Why is he a roaring lion? Because, because he's judged. He's judged. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, <laughs> because he's judged. Oh, I love this Bible. It is so wonderfully put, uh, the, w the, the way in which it is said. sometimes makes you stumble and you think, why is it written like that? But when you start analyzing it, that's why this must be divinely inspired. Mm -hmm. And the disciples remembered that word for word because it's written in red, they're quoting Jesus. Now, he wrote that a long time afterwards, John. He was sitting somewhere and writing. Well, coming to think of it, I mentioned earlier that all the disciples were killed. But there's also the promise of John. Yes. That, when, that wasn't killed by them but was with old age. All right. But did they try to kill him? Oh, numerous times. So there's a promise as well in the times that we're living in and we have to go through bringing this message to the world. All right. So verse 15 says, Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and thou shalt suck the breast of the kings, and thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. In other words, the Gentiles and the kings will come to your aid and help to nourish you. Yeah. They will supply the means that are necessary for whatever has to be done. For brass I will bring gold, for iron I will bring silver, and for wood, brass. So is there an upgrading? Yes. Mm -hmm. For stones, iron. I will also make thy officers peace and thine exactors righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. In other words, the law... And the judgments, you will praise them. Mm. Righteous are thy judgments. So in other words, all these people that have heard the message will be convicted under the outpouring of the latter rain and the loud cry, and many, many will turn to God. They will come out of Babylon in droves. Yeah. And sadly, many in God's church will leave mm -hmm. but their numbers will not decline yeah. the sun shall be no more thy light by day neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light and thy God thy glory in other words in that celestial city he outshines the sun one to ten so you don't need it right yeah. The sun shall no more go down, neither shall the moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the day of thy morning shall be ended. That's the promise of eternal life. The people also shall be all righteousness. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation, I the Lord will hasten it in his time. So these are the promises that we have 
for the outpouring of the latter rain and for the restoration of all things. Mm -hmm. So how important it is it that we let our light shine now? There's no other time because we are in gross darkness. Work while the day lasts, exactly. right? Exactly. Okay, so what you are saying is that we've got the period before the second coming where the latter rain is falling and then after that, the period that we are in heaven. Yeah, when everything is restored and what it will be like there. Absolutely correct. All right, so let's look at the, these typologies because we're talking about arise and shine. So we need to know what is it that we must do. Because all of these people must accept the truth. Otherwise, they can't come to you in droves, right? Yeah. So the sowing must have been done. Exactly. And under the latter rain, they must be called in. Now let's have a look at this story in First Kings, chapter 9 onwards. And it came to pass, when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all Solomon's desire, which he was pleased to do. Now, Solomon was building a physical house, the temple. We are instructed to build a spiritual house. Mm. Ye are the temple of the living God, says Paul. So the church, we have to build up the church. And it consists of living stones. So let's get the parallels here. That the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared unto him at Gibeon. And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever. What does that entail? His character. Aha. Uh -huh. And my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. And if, conditional, Thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and my judgments then. Is there a condition? Definitely. Does it still apply? And it's not only mentioned here. It's mentioned numerous times, so obviously okay. it still applies today. Then... I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever. As I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. Was he talking about Solomon or was he talking about Christ? Here? Christ. But, mm. conditional? Yep, if you don't. If ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods to worship them, and then comes a, a result, right? Mm -hmm. Does the same apply for the spiritual house? Yes, definitely. Why don't people get that? No, because they don't want it to pertain to themselves as well. Then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them and this house which I have hallowed for my name will I cast out of my sight and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword amongst all the people. Did it happen to the literal temple? Yes. Can it happen to a spiritual temple? Definitely. And at this house which is high everyone that passes by shall be astonished and shall hiss and they shall say why has the Lord done thus unto this land and unto this house? And they shall answer, Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have taken hold upon other gods, and have worshipped them and served them. Therefore has the Lord brought upon them all this evil. Is it possible that this can happen to a spiritual house as well? Yes. Well, By the way, in literal Israel, did they all go apostate or were there thousands that came out? No, thousands came out. All right. And they joined the Nazarenes. Yeah. They hadn't separated themselves from the Jews. They were still part and parcel of it, but eventually they were kicked out, right? And it came to pass at the end of 20 years when Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house, 
Now Hiram, the king of Tyre, had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees and with gold according to all his desire, that then King Solomon gave Hiram twenty cities in the land of Galilee, and Hiram came out from Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given him, and they pleased him not. There's always someone that's not pleased, right? Yeah, so the promises of God is not even enough. No. And Hiram, what did he say? What cities are these which thou hast given me, my brother? And he called them the land of Kabul unto this day. And Hiram sent to the king six score talents of gold. And this is the reason of the levy which King Solomon raised for to build the house of the Lord and his own house and Milo and the walls of Jerusalem and Hazor and Megiddo and Gezer. For Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and taken Gezer and burnt it with fire and slain the Canaanites that dwelt in the city and had given it for a present unto his daughter Solomon's wife. So Solomon had many problems, right? One of them was women. In a spiritual sense, what does that mean? Ecumenism. Mm. He thought he could reach the world through ecumenism. Did he succeed? No. No. No, not at all. So Solomon built Giza and Beth Horon, the nether, and Baalat and Tadmor in the wilderness, in the land, and all the cities of the store that Solomon had, and cities for his chariots, and cities for his horsemen. By the way, did the, the Lord say that they shouldn't multiply horses? Yes. He said so, right? Yeah, don't. But he imported them from Egypt. So was he, was he inclined to rely on his own strength? Oh, definitely. I mean, even if you go to the building of the temple, there were certain things that weren't exactly that God expected him to do it. Correct. He went to the other nations for help mm. when God had actually given the help to Israel, right? And the ones who were the experts in the fine work mm. were actually descendants of the very ones which God had blessed, but had gone to the heathens and intermarried and now came back sort of half associated and they did it for money. Yeah. Okay. And all the cities of the store that Solomon had and the city for his chariots and cities for his horsemen and that which Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem and in Lebanon and all the land of his dominion and all the people that were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, which were not of the children of Israel. Their children that were left after them in the land whom the children of Israel also were not able utterly to destroy. Upon those did Solomon levy a tribute for bond service unto this day. But... The children of Israel did Solomon make no bondsmen, but they were men of war and his servants and his princes and his captains and his rulers of chariots and his horsemen. There's a lot of typology in all mm. of this, mm. right? So in other words, Martin, there were things that he did that were right mm -hmm. and there were things that he did that were wrong. And in the beginning he was very zealous and he, he was walking in the ways of David his father, mm. except with the thing pertaining to Bathsheba. <laughs> but he had an inclination to be ecumenical. Yeah. That was a problem. And so we can learn a lot out of this and the state of the church as it is today. Mm -hmm. We have exactly the same problems. So the temple that we are supposed to be building is also suffering the same problems. Yes, and, and it needs some kind of cleansing. Now, we don't have to read everything that he did, but uh, God's people were obviously the ones that were supposed to be the head and not the tail. Let's just put that mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. So when it says the children of Israel did Solomon not make bondsmen, but they were men of war, and his servants and his princes and his captains and rulers of his chariots and of his horsemen. It's talking about the army of the Lord. And we are free men that by our own choice determine to serve the Lord. Mm. So we have to look at it in the spiritual sense. And he built all of these places. And Pharaoh's daughter came out of the city of David unto her house which Solomon had built for her. Then he 
built Milo. So he also uh, was inclined to do things for the other women that were yeah, in his yeah. environment. And then he made a navy. So he expanded. So the church, in other words, grew. And he had an association with Hiram, right? And Hiram sent his navy and they went and fetched gold from Ophir. And uh, he became exceedingly rich and wealthy. Mm -hmm. Do we have a similar situation today that the church has become rich and wealthy yes. and has good relations with other women? Definitely. And it should have actually been rich and wealthy in the knowledge of God and proclaiming that to the world. So Martin, in a spiritual sense, mm. this earthly thing where humans are involved, it, it has good things in it and then it has things that are not so good in it. What does God really want from his church? Yeah. Let's look at Psalms 45 and from verse 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. That describes the government of God. It's perfect. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh, aloes, and cassia. Who is it talking about? It's talking about Jesus. Yes, mm. it's the beauty of Jesus. And then look who's there. King's daughters were amongst thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. Who's this queen? That's the church. That's the church. But there are other women too that are honorable. In other words, there were many churches. Not mm -hmm. the churches of the Reformation, for example. Mm -hmm. Will they be represented in the kingdom of heaven? Yes. But overall and inclusive is the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. And she is the queen in gold of Ophir. She has the character. Fear. So we had it in type, but uh, uh, it was tainted. Yeah. This is perfect. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy lord, and worship thou him. So there's this relationship that God wants with his, with his church. And it's all about character. Mm. Now there's this interesting story in Kings chapter 10 when Solomon had built the house and he was full of zeal and he hadn't done everything right, but he, his heart was still right. Later on he became addicted to ecumenism and took all these women into his harem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to watch out for that, right? We are inclined to do exactly the same thing. Yeah, because with that crept in all the other apostasies. Yes, and maybe we can become the chairman of an ecumenical mm. or the vice chairman of an ecumenical council and think that thereby we please the Lord. Uh, <laughs> we better watch out for that. They better read what happened to Solomon. Uh, he became effeminate in the end. Yeah. But this is a beautiful story, 1 Kings 10, from verse 1. And when the queen of Sheba, now here's one of those women that represent more than just a woman, a church. Yeah. But she was a literal person, but she serves as a type of those that will stand there one day, that we just read about. She heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She came to prove him with hard questions so we've the church the true church has got doctrines out there and the other churches will come with hard questions to test it how can you say this and that and the other hard questions must you know your bible Very. how must you be prepared in here in order to bring the message they will come with hard questions you say this and that and the other you talk about 1844. Mm. It's a load of nonsense. Can you show us where it says that in the Bible? You say this, you say that. You talk about the mortality of man. You talk about all of these things. Show me. Mm -hmm. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and with 
very much gold and precious stones. When she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. She had many questions. Do the people in the world have many questions, Martin? <laughs> How many questions do we get? <laughs> We've got hundreds of them. Do we have people that do nothing else than answer questions? Yes, and they can't keep up. And they can't keep up, right? Do you answer questions? I try. but <laughs> I try as well. It's, it's sometimes very overwhelming. Let's put it that way. All right, but she had questions and she poured it out. She wanted to know everything. And Solomon told her all her questions. How many of the questions? All. All of them. Martin, should we be able to answer every single question? If Where do you get the information from to answer the question? In the Bible, Spirit, Spirit of Prophecy. You must study the law yeah. and the testimony, okay? All right. So Solomon was able to answer all the questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told or not. Who helped him? It must be the Holy Spirit, right? That's it. Okay. Now, was that enough? And when the Queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built and the meat of his table. Now, that's old English, so that should read in modern English, and the food on his table. Mm. So what did she look at? She looked at Solomon's wisdom. In other words, she weighed it up. She was like the Bereans. She, she checked whether it was so. She went and checked. Yeah. This is what it says, and this is how Solomon is describing him. And the house that he had built was the house which represents the spiritual aspect, the church. Was it in harmony with the wisdom? Mm. Must have been. What about the food on his table? Why is that important, Martin? Why would she look at the food on his table? It must have been different, right? It must be. Especially if you compare it to the rest of the world. All right, so the food on his table. What's, what's, what's all this stuff here? This vegan stuff on your table. This plant-based diet. Why? So she looked at the food of the ta at the ta on the table. And she looked at the sitting of his servants. Why would she look at the sitting at, of his servants? It depends on how he was, he was treating them. Okay. And maybe the butler mm -hmm. at one stage sat right next to him. Yeah. And she thought to herself, excuse me, what is the butler doing sitting next to the king? Any other earthly king would give him one smack and put him back in his place. Mm. But here, this butler is sitting right next to the king. And he's talking with him as, as though he's talking to his friend. That's weird. This king was treating people differently. Everybody the same. Okay, so the food on his table was different. Should the food on our table be different, Martin? Mm -hmm. Should people ask, why is your food on the table different? Definitely. Should you be able to take this book and say, uh, let me show you? No. Okay. Should we be treating people according to their stature or according to their relationship with Christ? To their stature and relationship with Christ. Okay. And how, that, how he sees them. And the attendance of his ministers and their apparel. They were dressed differently to the others. I think the ladies were modestly dressed. And the men also were different, different to the reds. And these cupbearers, everything was different. She had never seen anything like this before. And his ascent, mm -hmm. by which he went up in unto the house of the Lord. Did he go there as, mm. you know, the yeah. big knob, the king of Israel, or did he humbly um. go up the ascent? And when she saw all of these things, everything was different. The food on his table was different. His wisdom was unsurpassed. She checked it out. It was in harmony with everything that the prophets had said. 
The servants were treated different. His ministers, their clothing was different. His attitude was different. There was no more spirit in her. No more resistance. Yes. She realized that his talk was the same as his walk. Mm -hmm. And her resistance crumbled. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom, howbeit I believed not the words until I came and mine eye has seen it. How important is it that God's children live what they believe? The act as thy wisdom. You and have to have the fruits of what you say. And behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I have heard. Martin, if you sit down in a Bible study, they come with their hard questions mm -hmm. and they try and trip you up. Must you be fortified? You have to. And you also get this at the end, if it is truly so. Can you and compromise? Or no. must there be fruit in harmony with what you believe? It must be so that they also can say even more. You answered all the questions. And I even gained more than I thought. Than I thought I would. Okay. So what did she say? She said, Happy are thy men. Happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God which delighteth in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. Who is this king actually representing? Christ. Christ. Yeah. So when the people come to a modern situation, they must say exactly the same thing. They must recognize Christ. Because the Lord loved Israel, he loved the church, and therefore he was the king to do judgment and justice. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold and spices and great store and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And the navy also of Hiram that brought gold from Ophir brought it in from Ophir. Great plenty of almug trees and precious stones. Uh, doesn't the Bible speak about living stones? Mm. Doesn't the Bible speak of jewels in the New Jerusalem? And that it represents people, the twelve yeah. apostles and the patriarchs and all of these things. So it's the building up of the church, right? And almug trees. Now, almug trees are very interesting, Martin, because they are resistant to decay. Okay. They have like a natural decay resistance and they have a natural insecticide in them. So, so they cannot be attacked. They are like, like pillars that stand forever and they have a particular aroma. And what did he do with these trees that are so enduring and that have this aroma and are resistant to decay? What does that tell you about character? Yeah, stands firm, cannot be moved. Cannot be moved, cannot be chewed away. Mm. It, it is just protected, mm. naturally protected. So the king made of the almud trees pillars for the house of the Lord. Doesn't the Bible say, he who overcomes, I will make a pillar yeah, in, in the house of the Lord? Yeah. The parallels are amazing, aren't amazing. they? They're so fascinating. And for the king's house, what else did he make with the Almutmut? Harps also, and psalteries for singers. So will these pillars of Almut would make music to the Lord? Yeah. You like music, don't I you? I love music. You love music. My wife is a musicaholic. <laughs> <laughs> she loves music as well. There came no such almug trees, nor were seen unto this day. Martin, do we have to be these trees in the end? Yes. We have to be almug trees in the end. That we can be called to be pillars in the house of the Lord. And King Solomon gave unto the Queen of Sheba all her desire. 
So it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. She brought much into the church and she received everything that she could ever desire. Is that an explanation of what will happen? Yes. So what can we bring? We can only bring Jesus and the truth and the light. All right. But we must also bring our efforts, our best yeah, efforts yeah. and our and our, our works, not to attain anything, but because we have received all that we yeah. desire. We have to be all in. So she got whatever she asked. Beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty, so she turned and went to her own country, she and her and her servants. How much did she receive? More than she gave. Even more. Well, it lets me think of the tithing as well. The Lord says, "Prove me in this." Yes. You will get more out of it than you ask for. It's it's actually an amazing story, and and the typology in this is is so overwhelming. Now the weight of the gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred three score and six talents of gold. Martin, that's a very interesting number because it's six six six, and six 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 in the end can be turned round and become a very negative thing. We must be very careful. Definitely, if you take it in the context of you cannot serve Mammon and God. Yes, this has got to do with Mammon. So what we need is we need spiritual gold yeah. that cannot be turned into mammon. Besides that, he had merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants and all the kings of Arabia and all the governors of the county. And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold and 600 shekels of gold went to one target, and he made 300 shields of beaten gold, and all of these things, we don't even have to read it all. Mm. The fact of the matter is, eventually, what happened to all this glory, and all this gold, and all of these things, what happened? Destroyed. Gone. It was taken away. Mm. And instead of those beautiful shields of beaten gold, they made... Shields of brass. Yeah. Brass for gold, Martin? And you shine it up so that it looks like gold, but in actual fact, it's just brass. Yeah. Can we become brass instead of gold? Unfortunately, yes. Do you think our church could possibly um, be in the business of presenting brass for gold? We'll have to improve, right? We have to go back to the stage. You will not receive the latter rain if you have replaced the gold with brass. Yeah. In fact, the Bible tells us that all of King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold. And all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. For the king had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish bringing gold and silver and ivory and apes and peacocks. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom. That's what it should be. Mm. Beware of ecumenism, loving other women. Beware of exchanging gold for brass. And eventually all the ships were destroyed. Yeah. And there was no gold coming in anymore. And the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones, and cedar made he to be as the sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen yarn, and the king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price. Now, the Bible says he shouldn't have brought the horses. Do not multiply your horses. We're supposed to rely on the Lord. Yeah. So we're not supposed to li rely on our own strength. And I certainly don't want the linen of Egypt. I want a white robe of righteousness. Not a fake robe like some people wear that is all white. And a chariot came up and went out of Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And so for all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria did they bring them out by their means. 
So they went over and above what God had said. So, Martin, we have now a picture of what it was like in its glory. Mm -hmm. We also have a picture of what it's like when it goes wrong. But in the end, it must be like it was when it was in harmony with God's will, right? And true, like this whole story brought together, the church at the end will have to be as Solomon was in, his, in the days when he was righteous. Yes, absolutely. So when we talk about Arise and Shine, the canvassing work should no longer be neglected. Many times I've been shown that there should be a more general interest in our canvassing work. The circulation of our literature is one very important means of placing before men and women the light that the Lord has committed to his church to be given to the world. Now today, Martin, can the electronic world replace some of us? Yeah. Not in its entirety, because the book is always essential, but the electronic world is important, so we need to do that. The circulation of our literature can be done electronically in the world today. And placing before men and women the light that the Lord has committed to his church to be given to the world. The book sold by our canvases opened to many minds the unsearchable riches of Christ. In the service of God, there is work of many kinds to be performed. In the service of the temple, there were hewers of wood, as well as priests of various orders, bearing various degrees of responsibility. Our church members are to arise and shine, because their light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon them. Let those who know the truth arouse out of sleep and make every effort to reach the people where they are. The work of the Lord must no longer be neglected by us and made secondary to the worldly interests. We have no time to be idle or discouraged. The gospel is to be proclaimed to all the world. The publications containing the light of present truth are to go forth to all places. Is this our job? 100%. Should we stop infighting and concentrate on this? Sure. Brace together. Why are we not more wide awake? Each worker may now understand his special work and receive strength to take hold of it anew. Distinct and peculiar developments of the boundless glory of God will bring tributary offerings of various kinds to the feet of Jesus. Every new disclosure of the Savior's love turns the balance for some soul in one direction or the other. The end of all things is at hand, the men of the world are rushing on their ruin. Their schemes, their confederacies are many. New devices will continually be brought in to make of no effect the counsel of God. Men are heaping up treasures of gold and silver to be consumed by the fires of the last days. It is essential that we involve ourselves in evangelism. By whatever means. Whatever means. And there are so many different um, ways to do it these days, like you said, electronically, even if you still do it with the physical literature. Yes. Do it. Don't do it. Don't neglect it. But we should also start operating institutions. We're supposed to make the health ministry prominent. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to have schools of the prophets. In other words, it's schools of evangelism. We should be operating on many levels. True. But in order to operate yeah. on many levels, we need many hands. And because we know that time is short, there's no time to have lengthy study periods. That's what the Spirit of Prophecy says. So we need to have concentrated short courses. Martin, I think that we should do that. We should actually become involved in evangelism training. And we should have even courses of this nature on the internet so that people can be empowered with information to go and take the message to the world because time is short. Definitely. So if we go to the book of Mark, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. How will they believe if they haven't heard? And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Martin, we need to see this. Believe it. We, we don't want a fake no. system, but we want one built on righteousness and truth. Mm. If we do what is right, these promises are ours. Yeah. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth. And they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the words with signs, following. This is our job, this is what we are called to do, and this is what we have to do. And the time is now. The time is short and the time is now. So there's no time anymore for dilly-dallying, no time for postponing. We all have to put the shoulder to the wheel. So again... Let's appeal to the brethren. Forget the infighting. Put the shoulder to the wheel. Let's preach the three angels' messages. Let's do it by every single means possible. Let's do it by colportering. Let's do it by the electronic media. Let's do it by raising up health institutes. Let's do it by raising up schools of evangelism. Let's do it by every means possible. Amen. It's time. <laughs> Heavenly Father, arise and shine for thy light has come is the command that comes from the pen of inspiration. Help us to be not only receivers in ourselves, but to be transmitters, reflectors of this great light that has been shed upon us. Bless your people. Raise up your church and may the queens of Sheba come in their droves, receive the message, everything that is in their heart, see the difference, embrace the truth and become part of the army of the Lord is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.